Now, she was due on uh, the 22nd, I believe, and I was sweating it there for a while that she would come soon enough to uh, make our tax uh, write-off. But she did, so and she came on Christmas Day. And when you have a Christmas baby in a Catholic hospital, you're the star of the show. Instead of putting her in a receiving blanket, they put her in a, uh, a Christmas stocking with a little Santa Claus hat. And before we could leave, the head nun had to come and give her a special uh, blessing. Now, having a Christmas baby has been a complication through the years. You have to sort of balance Christmas in the morning and birthday in the afternoon. And, you know, pity the poor soul that gave Tressa a, a birthday present um, wrapped in Christmas paper. That just, you didn't do that. That's the worst possible thing. So, yeah, th- it is slightly unusual to have a child whose birthday is on Christmas. But then everything about that first Christmas baby was unusual. He was born of a virgin, which that's fairly unusual. And he was born to parents who were on the road traveling, traveling toward a census that was commanded by the Roman government, traveling away from the gossip back home. He was born in a stable and lane in a manger. That's kind of a... Nobody ever said to Jesus when he accidentally left the door open. Hey, were you born in a barn? Why, yes, I was, as a matter of fact. That's kind of unusual. It was unusual to have a band of scraggly strangers show up uh, after the the birth, like the the shepherds. That must have been slightly unusual to, to Mary and Joseph. And then what child has gold, frankincense, and myrrh given uh, to him at his baby shower? I did hear one time that there was a fourth Christmas gift to the Christ child, but that uh, wise man was turned away because he brought fruitcake, and that just was totally uh, unacceptable. And then the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Angels appearing to those shepherds in the field, announcing that the Messiah, the Christ child, was born. We saw this text last week, and let's revisit it today. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Good news of great joy. But what I want you to focus on this morning, we bring you good news. Well, the original word there is the Greek word for gospel. The very next time that word was used, that Greek word was used, was of John the Baptist. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The very next time that word appears in the New Testament, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Okay, so now I've got the choice. Do I continue and not be able to advance slides? No, I got to go get it. Has that ever happened before? Um, we can switch to, to this scene, I, I guess. The, um, the good news of great joy. What I want to talk about this morning is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. When we preach the gospel, well, I didn't grow up thinking about the gospel as being uh, the birth of Jesus. In fact, if you look at the uh, article in the bulletin day, it shows you that the way that I grew up was basically ignoring the religious connotations of the holiday and just enjoying the family part of it. But what we're going to see today, we're just going to look at the way that the word gospel is used and to make the point that when we preach the gospel, we preach a message that Jesus came to earth in the form of this little baby. And without that incarnation, without God become flesh and dwell among us, There is no gospel message at all. The word gospel, or at least the word that is translated gospel, appears 130 times in the uh, New Testament, in both its verb and its noun form. Sometimes it's referred to as a noun, the gospel, and then sometimes it's the verb, to preach the gospel, but you combine those all together. It's 130 times. That's a lot of times that word is used, in, and it's very often translated in our English translation as good news. Luke 4 and verse 43, I must proclaim the good news, so that's the word for gospel, of the kingdom of God in other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Jesus said the the reason that I'm here is because I have come to proclaim good news. I can't just stay in this village. I've got to go to all of these villages to proclaim the good news of the kingdom 
of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Remember in Matthew 11 when John the Baptist is waiting execution, uh, he sends some uh, messengers, some servants, some of his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one that is supposed to come, really? Or should we wait for another? Now, I think he's asking that for the benefit of the disciples because John doesn't have time to wait for somebody else. He's getting ready to be executed. And here's what Jesus says. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Those that have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So go back and tell all these miracles that you're seeing, but also tell them, you know, as far as the dead being raised, that's pretty dramatic. The deaf hearing, I think that is greatly dramatic. I would like to see that one repeated. Uh, the blind scene, uh, Troy, can I get a, an amen on that one? The, uh, by the way, Troy is back teaching our, uh, our, our children this morning because uh, both Francine and Shirley are sick. So Troy volunteered to do that. Uh, that's wonderful. Amen. Okay, the, um, besides all of those great miracles, dramatic miracles, the gospel, the good news, is being proclaimed to the poor. Go back and tell uh, John that. In Corinth, some of the people in the church were a bit embarrassed by the Christian message of the resurrection. Now, that's sort of understandable when you understand in their context Raising the dead, uh, afterlife itself, was not something that was talked about very much. And um, so, you remember when Paul was preaching to the philosophers, the eggheads at, uh, at the Areopagus, they listened to him until he got to the part of the resurrection, and then they mocked him and made fun of him. That idea of the resurrection just was so foreign to Greek thought that there were some evidently in the church at uh, uh, at Corinth that we're saying there's not really going to be a resurrection or maybe the resurrection has already taken place. Um, and so Paul has to emphasize that. And the way that he does that, he points them to the central message of the gospel. He says this in verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel the good news that I preached to you, which you've received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel... Good news, you are saved if you firmly hold to the word that I have preached, otherwise you believed in vain. And then he emphasizes what that gospel message is. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What I stressed at the first as being the first part of the message that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and then he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. So when Paul talks about what this good news is, this good news is that Jesus died, that he was buried in a tomb, and then he raised again on the third day. And it's that good news, that gospel that you've committed your life to, and that you must continue or else you've believed in vain. Well, Jesus could not have died, and he could, have, could not have been buried, and he could not have been raised to dead if he had not been born in that manger at Bethlehem. God became flesh so that he could give himself uh, for our sins and be raised to show our victory over sin and death. Without his birth, there could not be a death. In fact, when Paul is summing up to Timothy what the gospel is all about, he says this in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 8. Timothy is flagging a little bit in his confidence, and Paul is trying to build that up. And he says, remember Jesus Christ. And then he says two things, raised from the dead, descended from David. And then he says, this is my gospel. The gospel of the resurrection of Jesus, yes, but the fact that uh, Jesus was born as a descendant of David, that was also part of the message of the resurrection. This is my good news. This is the message of the gospel, that he was born, that he died, and that he raised again. We proclaim unto you, the angel said, good news of great joy. The gospel began to be preached that night to the uh, shepherds in that field near Bethlehem. Uh, by angels themselves, we bring you the gospel of great joy, that we have great joy, that we have the salvation message of the gospel because God became flesh and dwelt among us. But there's a sense in which that gospel that began to be preached that night in Bethlehem did not begin that night in Bethlehem. Uh, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 
He saved us and calls us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And then he continues, this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. It has now been revealed through the appearing of our, Lord, our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. He destroyed death and, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, through the good news. And that started, he says, before the beginning of time. When God created the world, he had in his mind this plan. Mom and I were talking this past week about a lot of things, and one of the things that she brought up, and it's always, it's always amazed her, she said, how the Bible can talk about the gospel being in the mind of God before the world was even created. That Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Peter will say in his gospel. That, and we, we talked about that a bit, and we agreed that, you know, when you're God, it's really hard to get something sprung on you at the last minute. God has never said, boy, I didn't see that coming. You know, when you know everything, you not, nobody's going to give you a surprise party. You're just going to see it coming. And so when God created the world, he saw coming the rebellion and sin that would lead. But he loved us enough to con- create us anyway. And he loved us enough to where his son was, this grace was given before the beginning of time. The gospel was revealed before the beginning of time. This gospel first declared that night before the shepherds bring you good news of great joy. That gospel was the message of John the Baptist and then the message of Jesus. And then Jesus told the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel so that other people will get this good news of great joy. I mentioned the bulletin article sometime Later, <laughs> read that. It, it does tell. It's a, it tells a story of a of a, a woman that was raised a Jew and became an atheist, and she looked around and saw what fun Christians have during Christmas, and she thought she was missing out, you know. And so she decided she was going to give herself full bore to the Christmas holidays. She was going to decorate, and, and she was going to uh, you know make cookies, and she was going to have fruitcake, and she was going to hang mistletoe. She was do all the things. She was just going to stay away from the religious overtones, those silly stories that Christians tell. But she was going to enjoy the holidays because she believed that the message of Christmas was joy and love and peace. And in the article, I make the observation how Similar that was to the way that I was raised. Christmas was a big deal at my house, but we very carefully stayed away from any religious undertones. So when mom sent out Christmas cards, she looked carefully to find something with Frosty the Snowman and not a manger scene, uh, not a nativity scene. And when we decorated, we, uh, we didn't put an angel on the top of our Christmas tree. We tr- stayed as far away from the story of the first Noel as possible because, after all, the Bible doesn't say to observe Christmas, so we shouldn't observe it either. And that's exactly the way that atheistic Jew decided she would observe Christmas. Well, here's the part uh, that I didn't put in the article, the part I saved for the sermon. What is it that brings you the greatest joy during this time of the year? What is it that you look forward to? Is it the special food that we have during this time of year? My mother used to make chess cake on Christmas. The only time during the year she made it, and I loved it. So I had to wait all that time, you know, before she would make that. Uh, what other time of year are you going to drink eggnog? I mean, eggnog is just a slimy drink, you know, but Christmas time, it becomes very special. Is that what you look for, the special food at Christmas time? Um, or is it f- gathering with family? You see people during this time of year that you don't see maybe other times of the year. Is that what you look forward to? Or is it the decorations and the festive uh, attitudes of, of people or just the time off from work? Well, if that's really the joy that we have during this time of year, then we're observing Christmas just like that atheistic Jew, just like I did when I was growing up. Should not the greatest joy of this time of year be in that the world, for a split second, but the world is focusing on what is the most important thing in our life, that Jesus came, that Jesus uh, brings the grace of God, that Jesus died and rose again, and that the rest of the year the world doesn't pay too much attention to this story. 
But now they do. And now they're listed in. Now we can celebrate that uh, Jesus came. The gospel, the good news of great joy that God has come near so that we can come near to him. This morning, let's let Jude have the final word in our lesson. Jude, the uh, disciple that wrote the book of Jude, was also more than likely uh, originally named Judas, who was one of Jesus' brothers. He ends his book like this. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. The only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for the message that you give us that Christ came into the world for us, that you loved us so much, that he loved us so much, that he was willing to come and suffer the things that we suffer through. Not so that he can learn anything, fathers, because we know that as God, he already knew everything. But so that we can know that he understands the trials and struggles and temptations that we have. That he was tempted every way that we are, yet without sin. And because he died and rose again, we can have our sins forgiven. Father, we're thankful for a time of year when people are more open to this message of the coming of Jesus. Father, help us not to revel so much in the, uh, the traditions of this time of year that we forget this message that is part of your gospel that the angels pronounced that night. More, uh, I announced good tidings of great joy that will be for all the people. And Father, help us to glory in that message and share that message with others. We're so thankful that your son came. And it's through him we pray. Amen. If there's something going on in your life that you need to uh, repent of, that you need to pray with one of our elders about, there'll be some in the back, of, some of our elders will be in the back of the auditorium. So as we sing this next song, uh, then just make your way back there. Or if you're ready to name Jesus as your Savior and put him on in baptism, then you can uh, let them know that as well. So let's sing one more time about that good news of great joy that is for all the people as we stand and worship together. <laughs>